All right. Hi, everyone. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes. Fantastic. So welcome. We are so glad that you could make it this evening for our season finale of the winter 2021 session of Beyond the Walls, a partnership between Oshawa Public Libraries and the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. We will be taking a break for the spring and the summer, which is when everybody kicks their research projects into high gear. And when we come back in the fall, we are excited to share all of our work with you again. I would like to start this evening together with a land acknowledgement. We are thankful to be welcome on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabe nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. Most importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. Our practice in these events is to turn our attention to our guest, who will speak for roughly 20 minutes, give or take. We'd appreciate it if everybody could please keep themselves on mute during this time. Afterwards, we turn the remainder of our evening over to questions and discussions, and you are welcome to unmute yourself to ask a question, or if you prefer, you are welcome to type it into the chat. And now I am really, truly stoked to introduce Dr. Stephen Downing, a nerd like me who does research on video games and online cultures. He's an associate professor in Ontario Tech's criminology program, and he explores issues of deviance and criminal behaviors, including how things like violence and prison life are represented in video games and why paying attention to these representations is important. So without further ado, Let's learn about crime, punishment, and video games. Thanks, Andrea. And I will uh, go ahead and talk over as I uh, begin sharing my screen here. I see some nods, so um, that probably means you can hear me. Um, I forgot I was the season finale, so I would say kind of set your expectations low and and think of this as like the the last mass effect game if you're a gamer so um and i i want to thank the uh, oshawa public library as well for having me i worked as a library page uh during high school so hopefully this will make up for all of those um, misplaced books uh back then. But um, in any case, um, as uh, my colleague Andrea mentioned, um, I'm a criminologist. So part of what I'm going to do tonight is sort of walk through um, how criminologists are uh, looking at video games and how really one of the things that I think is interesting about um, criminological uh, sort of um, topics uh, on, on gaming is that they really reflect kind of more holistically what criminologists kind of look at, especially around um, youth crime and how youth uh, crime or delinquency has been framed uh, historically. So you see this picture here kind of um, shows uh, a very old picture of kind of like an early arcade before it was even uh, electronic and had screens. Um, so um, media and crime, to give you some background, um, media and crime courses are um, pretty regularly offered in um, criminology programs. Um, but up until very recently, and even now, um, these programs typically don't uh, 
um, cover a lot about games. Um, and when they do talk about games in connection to crime, uh, o- almost overwhelmingly, they focus on um, the potential for, uh, or that potential connection between um, gaming and violence or exposure to gaming and violence. Um, so I will I will walk through that tonight. I think um, my when I first started studying video games, it was, as Andrea pointed out, I am a, a nerd, a gamer uh, myself. Um, and I was kind of frustrated by this um, very singular focus within my discipline on um, that potential violence connection. So um, one of the things I've tried to do is draw attention to all these other ways in which we can look at games um, as a, a really important um form of media. Um, So um, just some background about um, who plays games, and I'll kind of focus on Canada specifically. Um, It often surprises people. um, It it perhaps doesn't surprise you that the uh, uh, video game industry is huge. Um, In Canada in 2017, Um, Some estimates uh, place its uh, sort of value at 3.7 billion um, and 61% of the population uh, identifies themselves as people who play games and the average age of the Canadian uh, video game player was around 39 um, with 50, about half being male, half being female. Um, So this kind of challenges what a lot of people typically assume um, in that, you know, gamers tend to be just uh, kind of uh, relegated to youth. That's actually not the case at all. Um, And of course, game developers and publishers recognize this and there's a huge market there with um, aging millennials, for example, who have more um, expendable income. Um, But nevertheless, there, ha- you know, despite the normalization of gaming, um, there has been a, a societal focus on, um, you know, predating games, of course, on kind of problematizing youth uh, and the spaces they occupy and the th- the uh, hobbies that they pursue. Um, so there's always been this fear of youth leisure time. So in other words. Um, you know, even early criminologists um, in the in the Chicago school, there was a lot of discussion about um, this problem of kids having time on their hands, um, idle time, and and this notion that kids are getting into trouble. Um, and there's always been this fear of unsupervised uh, youth spaces. Um, so this is really. Um, I have a picture of an arcade here. Um, there was even some research as early as in the, the 80s that tried to look at um, whether or not arcades were sort of this place in which uh, delinquency you know, was, was being cultivated. Um, and so researchers, um, th- this kind of reflects um, a, a broader question in criminology about um, kind of youth and the, the, whether or not um, the things youth do in their leisure time um, either insulates them from being involved in delinquency or encourages them to engage in delinquency. Um, but nevertheless, um, gamers have um, until relatively recently been s- stigmatized um, and sort of marginalized. Um, so now it's become uh, you know common for gamers to be depicted in TV shows, and even celebrated to an, a certain extent. And that's partly because the industry has grown and, and recognized that there's a lot of money to be made. Um, but you saw even um, before video games were popular, Dungeons and Dragons uh, was uh, very stigmatized and demonized. And there's, I won't go into details, but there's actually a really long, interesting um, history of how um, Dungeons and Dragons was sort of um, you know, people thought, or there was this sort of narrative going on in the media that it was, uh, you know, indoctrinating young people into satanic cults and that kind of thing. It turned out that wasn't true at all. Um, So there's this long history of kind of um, 
stigmatizing people who play these games um, and, and that carried into video games. Um, and in criminology, we talk about moral panics um, and uh, Cohen talks about this cr the creation of folk devils as a way to sort of other people uh, who who may be doing something that's you know uh, viewed as abnormal or or uh, stigmatized in society um, and video games certainly um, to some extent have uh, fallen into this category um, and. This really probably reached its apex uh, with the Columbine shootings, which I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar with. Um, and in this case, there were lots of uh, fingers were being pointed. Um, Doom, in particular, the, the game Doom uh, received some blame. Um, and some of the victims of the families of the victims uh, in the Columbine shooting even tried to sue uh, game uh publishers. Um, and politicians, of course, uh, got on board here and in, in the media, you see the, the Times cover there. Um, and this, this kind of coincided with a period in the 90s of uh, pathologizing um, youth. And there was kind of this and some of you may remember this, the, the language was in the media as well, of kind of predicting the rise of the child super predator. Um, and a lot of even criminologists uh, were, not a lot, but some criminologists were predicting um, this rise of the child super predator in the late 90s. Um, and I'll, I'll get around to showing some um, some figures there, but it didn't happen. Um, in fact, the opposite happened. Uh, youth violence rates went down. Um, but nevertheless, um, there was also simultaneously kind of this sh paternalistic shift um, and a lot of kids were getting locked up. Um, so this this goes back to what I said about there. there's always been this kind of fear of youth, um, you know, uh, becoming, you know, uh, youth having their own space or their their own unsupervised uh, hobbies or spaces that, that they occupy. Um, so, you know, you see, this is another example from a, a I'm picking on Time Magazine, but um, they, you know, kind of have, have continued this. And you see even here, this was a recent um, story that was run in the New York Times uh, during the pandemic that's still ongoing. Um, and actually this story in the New York Times, there were quite a few responses written to this in other uh, uh, news magazines that were quite critical of it um, for the reasons I've discussed, that it was sort of feeding into this moral panic. So um, we've shifted a little bit away from uh, this notion that video games are creating, you know, a future generation of super predators, but we still we still problematize gaming in a way that very much pathologizes the gamer. Um, and this pathologization really tends to still focus on this view of the gamer as a young person, often a young person who's isolated uh, and you, you know, the stereotypes of a gamer in the basement alone, um, who's antisocial and all these other things. When in fact, we know that, um, increasingly and in fact all uh, most gamers are part of some sort of community and they play with other people either locally or online um and so you know this certainly one thing we remind students is correlation is not causation so um that means that just because we see that there is a rise in video game sales and a decrease in youth crime rate that doesn't mean there's a causal effect there, but nevertheless, um, this sort of moral panic about uh, the child super predator being linked to, you know, exposure to these games um, just hasn't really played out. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, a good time to mention that um, a lot of the studies uh, focus on aggression linked to video games and not necessarily violence. Um, and the difference is aggression is sometimes operationalized as um, physiological arousal. So you watch something violent, you, you play a violent game, and there are signals in your brain that can be measured or there are ways they can test to see if you're immediately uh, aroused uh, and, and, you know, you have the potential for aggression. Um, but 
there's been very few studies that have looked at whether or not that actually manifests as acts of violence, particularly over time. Um, and those that have, have found pretty weak evidence um, that that's the case. Um, and then you see here uh, kind of another way to look at it is um, to look at you know, where video games are sold most and therefore presumably uh, played, or at least that's one way to interpret that the most, and then look at um, violent gun deaths. Um, and you see, unsurprisingly, of course, we unfortunately, we've seen a lot in the news lately about uh, gun violence in the US, but uh, unsurprisingly, it's um, the highest there of kind of these top ranking countries where games are um, sold. Um, so this kind of mirrors research that uh, on on various correlates of uh, gun violence that really suggests that um, you know the the single most important factor there is the availability of guns. It's not the exposure to media and that kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of a crash course in the um, the research on on the connection between violence and gaming. Um, and I wanted to do that not to necessarily debunk or challenge it. I think there is still um, more research being done on it. So I, I wouldn't say that I am uh, taking a particular side, um, but I think it's important to um, sort of frame that in a, in, a, in a context where we understand where that fear has come from um, and, and some challenges to those assumptions. Um, so I'll move on um, to talking about, um, as Andrea mentioned in the introduction, how crime and the criminal justice system uh, are depicted in games. Because I think that um, personally, I find that more interesting um, because the violence connection really um, hasn't hasn't gotten us uh, very far, um, and and the the research is is mixed and and contested. Um, so we can think about how various sort of uh, actors and and institutions within the criminal justice system are represented. Um, and similar to other forms of media, um, games tend to either valorize the police um, and uphold this notion of sort of police uh, problems with policing being the result of uh, bad apples uh, or corrupted individuals. Um, and or they cast them as sort of these potential enemies, um, often in an open world setting like Grand Theft Auto here, uh, this screen grab is from that, um, where uh, the player plays as, quote, the bad guy. Um, and other as we've, of course, moved into a, into an era where online games are, you know, uh, played as much as offline games. Um, one of the interesting things is there's all these opportunities for role playing where people play role play as the police or they role play as criminals. Um, so you see these interesting things emerging again in um, Grand Theft Auto where you have um, you know, people who are actually, uh, actual people are the police, actual people are uh, the uh, criminals. Um, and I think from a criminological perspective, that's really interesting. Um, if any of you saw the movie recently about the Stanford prison experiment, um, I think it's really interesting to imagine this as sort of an experiment where we can look at how um, people actually play out these different roles and how they handle concepts of uh, responsibility and authority. Um, and in the same sense, um, some of my research, again, as Andrea mentioned, I've looked at how um, prisons have been depicted and the prison experience have been depicted in video games. Um, and there are very limited portrayals there. This is um, actually um, kind of oddly enough, a growing genre, sort of the prison themed video game. Um, but my research, um, some of it has looked at portrayals of pains of imprisonment um, and also looked at um, simulation games where you run prisons and looked at some of the ways in which games, uh, game developers design games um, to give feedback to the player about how they, um, for example, manage a prison. Um, so, um, my co-authors and I um, talk a little bit about how, um, you know, these games could actually potentially be used to help people empathize or help people understand um, how uh, maybe uh, uh, 
reimagining um, prison could actually um, lead to uh, less recidivism. Um, but one of the things I, I've, I've recently public, uh, co-authored a, a paper where we looked at portrayals of um, gender and race in prison games specifically, and we found that typically or, or really with the existing um, very small genre of prison games, they almost overwhelmingly only portray sort of the stereotypical um, male prison experience. Um, and they don't really address sort of the uh, racial and gender nuances uh, within these institutions, um, which is a missed opportunity. Um, so of course we suggest that developers um, consider doing that because um, just like with film, um, these portrayals can lead to reinforcing stereotypes, but they can also lead to uh, educating the public about um, issues around incarceration and its impact on people. Um, so another area um, that we can think about is how sort of the state, uh, the, the role that the state um, plays in the video game industry um, and the military industrial complex has historically been pretty involved um, with gaming um, in terms of consulting, developing their own games. Here you see um, this was a, a, a game actually produced by uh, the US military. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at even just sort of the advertisement here in terms of the wording there, empower yourself, defend freedom, the official US army game. So um, this is, you know, people have sort of been critical of uh, the military's role or the military's use of gaming to um, kind of as propaganda and um, to promote recruitment and to sort of justify or, or promote foreign wars. Um, so this is an area where um, some people outside of criminology actually have, have probably done the most uh, work. And then another area um, where criminologists um, and people outside of that discipline are looking more and more um, is this, you know, beyond that violence connection, looking at the impact of exposure uh, to violence directed at certain groups um, in terms of a desensitizing effect um, or affecting um, empathy that people might show for certain groups. So um, there's been quite a few studies that have looked at uh, violence against women um, and how, and, and some studies have provided evidence that exposure to uh, violence against women in gaming um, leads to uh, greater uh, victim blaming of women who are uh, victims of violence. Um, other studies have contested that to some extent. So, um, that's the case with most uh, scholarly research, but there is some evidence that that um, is the case. Um, and of course, uh, there are lots of tropes, uh, gender kind of uh, gendered tropes that emerge in video games, and these are be ch being challenged more and more. Um, but one of the uh, areas of research that is really emerging um, is looking at um, toxic gaming culture itself and how it excludes um, certain groups. So uh, women being one of these, um, historically, uh, it's been framed as a, a very male-centric space, um, which um, obviously the, the demographics of players challenges that, but nevertheless, um, there is sort of this uh, barrier for um, girls and women to uh, game that that's rooted in um, some toxic kind of masculinity. Um, and so there's more and more research that's looking at how that manifests um, and how that can be challenged. Um, and then we can think about how offenders are uh, portrayed in games. Um, and uh, some research has showed that this is a racialized portrayal so that um, uh, black people are portrayed more often as offenders, um, just like in other forms of media. Um, and that there is really a misrepresentation of kind of the, what we would typically think of as the uh, kind of distribution of, of offenders across uh, race, class, and gender lines. Um, 
And then there's an interesting kind of relationship between um, gaming and fear of crime in general. Um, and uh, some criminologists have written about this, what they refer to as a culture of fear. Um, and they've traced, um, so for example, with cybercrime, they've traced um, this culture of fear and sort of the construction of fear around cybercrime back to um, the cyberpunk genre. Um, and we saw this big game, Cyberpunk 2077, actually came out very recently. Um, and so the imagery that's presented in games of offenders and, and sort of crime in general actually does sometimes inform uh, public uh, perceptions and fears of crime in, quote, the real world. Um, so that's something that I think criminologists myself, of course, and some others are increasingly looking at. Um, and we've done that uh, with film and TV and other forms of media historically, but now we're kind of catching up and looking at games. Um, and then really what I find um, probably most fascinating and what I personally, most of my research has been on is the concept of deviant behavior or criminal behavior within games themselves. Um, so role-playing, um, as a criminal or an offender or, or a deviant and, and, you know, whether or not people, uh, or, or why people choose to play these roles, um, and how other players try to, uh, constrain, um, opportunities for deviant or criminal behavior within games. So, um, as a, uh, my, my dissertation, I, uh, played an online role-playing game, um, and I did an ethnography where, um, I studied thieves in this game who, uh, stole from other players and they, actually um, the game itself only allowed them to steal in a very kind of limited limited capacity um, and these thieves actually adapted and would use um, mechanisms external to the game to con people out of items that were worth you know hundreds thousands of dollars in real life uh, in real currency um, so my research was really about um, kind of the social control within those groups and how these um, deviant subcultures emerge within games um, around rules and rule breaking. Um, because I, I think that's really fascinating. It, it kind of adds this layer of nuance beyond that violence connection. Um, and so some researchers have, uh, Cowart in, in, in particular, um, has referred to going back to that idea of toxicity that, um, and kind of griefing other players um, as dark participation. So um, cheating, um, breaking the breaking the rules, trolling, trash talking, hate speech, griefing, doxing people. Um, and if you've ever played, you know, an online game with voice chat, you've probably been exposed to a lot of these things. Um, so there's an overlap between cyberbullying research and research on um, toxicity and gaming. Um, and more and more people are starting to look at that. Um, and the effect that that has on um, victims of this behavior. Um, in my research, I actually uh, I have published a piece on virtual victimization, and I found that um, even more pronounced uh, as a feeling of victimization amongst uh, those I studied was when they had um, in-game items stolen from them that represented, you know, potentially hundreds, if not thousands of hours of investment. So there is this um, sort of, um, although they're intangible, oftentimes sort of these items in the games represent something. And when those are stolen, um, a lot of people I talked to said they viewed that as a real form of uh, victimization. Um, and then so um, this, this uh, table here is from some of the research that I've done looking at um, how people import and export or don't import and export um, values uh, outside of the game into the game. Um, so I identified um, that most people sort of uh, conceptualized of this transition block um, where they they sort of thought, well, it's just a game. Um, so some people said it's just a game, so I have no desire to bring in my, uh, quote, real world beliefs 
behaviors and values. Um, others did import those into the game um, and that sort of affected the roles that they played in the game. Um, but then they said, you know, it's just a game. What I do in the game is it going to really impact what I do outside of the game. But then others actually did sort of view it more holistically. And they thought, you know, what happens in the game is a part of my real life. Um, so they met with virtual friends, they made real money, um, and they tended to prefer informal social control. Um, so they really bought into this notion of sort of a virtual social contract that was formed with other people that um, they were part of that wasn't dictated by um, the game developers themselves. So I think that's a really interesting, as, as a criminologist, um, thinking about a game as, as sort of a virtual uh, world in which um, a lot of the same questions we have about deviance and crime and social control and policing kind of carry over into that, that virtual setting. Um, and then, of course, esports. Um, we were just having a conversation about esports and the uh, Durham College and Ontario Tech teams uh, before this started. Um, and esports is a quickly growing industry. It's valued at uh, well over a billion dollars uh, USD now. Um, and most universities in the States uh, have teams. Many universities in Canada have teams. Um, many cities have teams that are associated with uh, traditional sports franchises. The Raptors, for example, have uh, an esports team where they play uh, NBA 2K. Um, and so research has started to turn um, towards esports and ask questions similar uh, to the ones they have with traditional sports. Um, I was just reading some research um, a few days ago um, that uh, actually e-athletes really face most, uh, if not all of the same stressors that traditional athletes do. Um, and this leads to some of the same outcomes around anxiety, depression, substance abuse. Um, and then of course, another sort of component of that um, Esports uh, emergence is uh, match fixing and gambling. Um, so, match fixing, there's been some seminal cases there. Um, and there, there is a lot of, well, not a lot, but there is some research emerging uh, around. In fact, um, I have a graduate student who's working on some research looking at um, digital items um, that are gambled on. And some governments have actually started to frame uh, the buying and selling of digital items in video games as a form of gambling uh, that should be regulated the same way as any other type of gambling. So for example, if a game gives you uh, a box that you open and it randomly spawns an item. Uh, some governments have framed that as a form of gambling. And of course, if um, kids are primarily the people uh, doing this, uh, that's raised some problems um, <clears throat> legally. And some countries have actually banned uh, this type of uh, system. So then thinking about the future, um, and I'm trying, I. This may or may not be going over 20 minutes, but uh, hopefully not too much. So thinking about the future of video games uh, and, and crime and deviance, um, there, there's some big things we can think about. One is um, just the changing demographics of who plays games. Um, gamers are getting older because you have, like I said, this generation of um, aging millennials already. Uh, and um, you have... Um, you know, groups that, um, for example, the, the, you know, the gender divide in gaming is, as, as those statistics kind of suggest, uh, really not prominent as it, as it once was. Um, immersion through things like uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are really going to create, I think, some interesting challenges for policymakers, but uh, also criminologists and researchers, um, because that notion of vir virtual victimization, um, if you can actually experience things in a very visceral and potentially even haptic, meaning like physically tactile way, um, there could be some real potential for harm there. Um, and some people have started talking about that, um, but it's really an area of research that's in its infancy. Um, and then 
connectivity is another issue thinking about um, sort of games as being always on. Um, and this connects to the increasing gamification of everything we do. Um, some of you may have heard of that term gamification. So kind of, um, you know, you can even download apps where you can kind of gamify, you can, you can set it up to give yourself experience for like brushing your teeth in the morning and going to work or doing your homework or uh, making dinner. Um, so there is an increasing, and some people have written about this gamification of our everyday lives. Um, so, you know, games and play are, are really a central part of the human experience. So I think as we continue to do research on this, um, thinking about how crime intersects with that um, and, and how, for example, if we, you know, in the distant future, we are sort of existing in this uh, state of mixed reality where we're seeing augmentations in our real world, um, you can certainly imagine um, circumstances where we would have to be very careful um, about what we see and who has access uh, to showing us things in that augmented um, reality. So I like to think a lot about those kind of far future questions. Um, and I think um, I always advise, uh, you know, for example, uh, policymakers to think about those things before uh, they're having to catch up. Um, so that was kind of a very quick crash course. I wanted to get through that as quickly as I could because I think the, the real fruitful thing will be to have an open discussion here. Um, here's a few um, books. Um, that I think would probably interest people. And I think um, Jen mentioned she had some more books um, that she would post in chat. Um, and I think these are a good place to get started if you just wanna look at uh, a diverse range of topics that people are studying around this. Awesome, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I have a million questions, but it's not fair if I hog all the question time. So before that, I would love to turn this over to our guests for your questions, your comments, your feedback. Have at it. I have one question. Absolutely, take it oh, away. Okay. All right, so Stephen, thanks so much for your talk. It's uh, really interesting. I was really, really surprised at the uh, the age, the average age of a gamer being 39, because I, I guess I always thought that it was geared towards more teenagers or young adults. Um, I'm just thinking about the developmental stages of children, right, and, and exposure. And you know how many games have the uh, parental warning or the, uh, I guess, labeling on them, you know, mature themes, teens. And I'm thinking about exposure for children, young, like young children, adolescents, and the effects of gaming on their growth, like their cognitive development or social development or... Um, have you come across anything in research to suggest that, you know, that it, it can be detrimental to young children as opposed to older adolescents or is there anything like that that you can comment on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I won't, you know, put myself out as an authority on childhood development. That's that's not really my area, but I've, I've read some stuff and I think it's it's mixed. I mean, there are, in fact, some studies I've read that suggest there's benefits to playing games um, for young people. I think um, there's questions around, like we use this phrase screen time a lot and like how much screen time uh, kids should have. Um, so I think a lot of it is around kind of the physiological impact, as you mentioned. Um, but yeah, I'm not really an expert on childhood development. I think that there's a lot of... Um, debate about that. Um, I, I do know that, you know, the information we have suggests that kids are like young children are playing games a lot more than like pediatricians are recommending. Um, so I think we, it stands to reason that we'll probably, and, and I think this is true even, you know, anecdotally when I was a kid, of course, my parents were always trying to get us to stop playing video games. And now, I'm a professor, you know, studying video games. So I think I, and, and I have so many friends like that, but I, I mean, I, of course, as a social scientist, I know you don't rely on anecdotes, but um, I think we, there's, there's, we can study these things. I think there's a lack of longitudinal research. So 
um, looking at, you know, the long-term impacts. I, I mentioned with violence, there's not really strong evidence that like, you know, people who play violent games go on later in life to commit acts of violence. Um, so I, I would say the jury's out, I, but I would think that we're in a good position to have pretty robust data about that, um, given that you have kind of these digital native, this digital native generation, because even, you know, older millennials didn't grow up as digital natives, but now you have a pretty substantial cohort of adults who did. So I, I think there's a potential to study that. I, I think my read on it is that there's benefits and probably some some risk as well, but they may be a little bit exaggerated, but I, you know, don't raise your kids based on that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Um, next question is coming from Hannah Scott. Hey, that was fascinating. I always like your talks. Um, they're just, they really make me think. Um, so what I was thinking about this, like as a person who likes to study people who are victims of crime, um, I'm finding the stuff you're saying about being victimized in cyberspace in this way, which can actually have very visceral context really neat. But my real question is actually, what is it that, I'm trying to envision a, uh, an industry where men are not the, the people who made it, but women. So um, I know early stuff talked that women liked sim worlds more, mm -hmm. creative, a lot of the kinds of things we're seeing or the games are like, I've never been interested in shooting people. So I've never really gotten into the gaming world. And I know there's a whole other set of products out there. And I'm assuming women may build products that are not as violent or victimizing. But what, what are the trends like for, for I guess, healthier games? Yeah, Maybe I'm making the wrong assumption that women would like healthier games. I don't um, know. I mean, it, no, I, there is some interesting research on genre preferences along um, all sorts of demographic lines, obviously. Um, and, and some of that research does bear out what you're suggesting, that women prefer certain genres over um, others compared to men. Um, and simulation games, for example, um, are, are one of those. Um, certainly there are lots of women who do play, you know, first person shooters and, and things like that, but there, there is a difference. Um, and I think that's one, I didn't even get into that because I was kind of, I mean, there's so much to talk about in, in game studies broadly. Um, but yeah, in terms of the industry composition, there is still, I mean, it's still struggling being an, you know, a male dominated, um, industry. Um, and I think that's a really great question. I think, um, I certainly look forward. I, I personally am a fan of simulation games. I think that's probably my favorite genre of games. And you saw, for example, um, Animal Crossing. I don't know if anyone, this is, this was a huge success and people have written all these things about how it was sort of this, uh, you know, this calming, uh, force that was was needed during the pandemic and everything. So I think, um, and, and then there's this whole other industry connected to, you know, gaming, that's the streaming industry. And you have so many, um, you know, important and challenging questions uh, coming up about uh, representations of gender in the streaming industry. And so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I could talk about this all night, but I, I do think that you're going to see, I mean, you've seen a diversification of genres and like, I think almost any game you can imagine, probably there's something close to it now. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's an, still continues to be an overemphasis on particular types of games or tropes within games. Um, and those are violent, uh, you know, very masculinized, imperialistic. Um, and I think that's an area that needs to be challenged. It's not enough to just say, let's get more women in the industry or let's get more women to play games. It's also, well, let's challenge some of those trends. And that's not to say we shouldn't have first person shooters, just like we wouldn't say, well, let's not, you know, tell them not to make any John, more John Witt movies. There's a place for those, but 
those maybe shouldn't be 90% of, of the films that are out there. Awesome. I just want to do a shout out to Thanari, uh, or Tharuni, sorry. Um, yeah, Steve Downing is a professor. Yeah, I saw that question and wanted to... <laughs> Shout Amazingly, I know. I wore a Fall Guy shirt tonight. I in in I thought about trying to look professional, but then thought, well, I'm talking about games, so I wore a gaming shirt. Thank you. I actually, to very briefly piggyback off of this last question and Stephen's answer, there's actually in my own research because I wasn't joking when I said and we are both nerds. Um, I look a lot at the history of games from a gender perspective. And in the 90s, there was this fascinating movement called the Girls Games Movement that was designed specifically to try to sort of write this imbalance of how games were being pitched to young people as primarily entertainment for boys. And so some of the stuff I've done around like the Nancy Drew games as one of like the longest running girls games games is, yeah. So if you are ever wanting to dig into this more, like the, the search term is the girls games movement. And then there's been a bunch of stuff done kind of following that since, but I will, Bite my tongue, because otherwise we will never get back to Steve. Yeah, yeah, and, but I mean, um... <laughs> I think that's, I mean, yeah, and there's there's also, I mean, it's not it's not just girls and women who, who have been, you know, um, I, I guess, I, I don't know. Yeah, Andrea, you're more of an expert, but I, I would say it's safe to say marginalized or excluded from kind of mainstream gaming spaces, but there's groups of, you know, LGBTQ gamers. I, I go to some gaming conventions and they have, you know, uh, groups that are trying to make inroads. So, and race is also an area that, you know, needs a lot of work <laughs> in gaming. Um, and so I think, and, and even, you know, we can say as an industry, we can break down some of these barriers, but within gaming um culture um you know there's a lot of work to be done um because you know ultimately some people for example don't want to and and i had a student who did research on this um he found a lot of people do not want to call themselves gamers because of this toxic connotation so i think in terms of like you know the label of gamer and what that means, that tells you something about how much work there is still to be done. But they're, they're, I, I'm optimistic. Um. All right, I'm going to pull another question for you out of the chat uh, from Peter. Is there a notable difference in attitudes, et cetera, between people playing criminal elements in single versus multiplayer games? And it is actually from Peter's son. Okay, um, so I studied I studied attitudes in multiplayer games. Um, so I, I can't speak too much to um, the single player question from my own research. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, in the multiplayer setting, um, the attitudes really varied. I mean, there was a huge range, and I, I viewed this as sort of like. Um, I, I kind of framed it as like the criminal underworld within this one particular game. Um, because again, these were people who um, the game allowed you to steal from other players, but you could only steal from them in a particular way. And some players thought that that was constraining their ability to role play as like a true thief. So they used external measures like, for example, um, chat programs to basically do like con, you know, con people out of um, items and money in the game. And they kind of justified it by saying this is um, like the, the developers won't let us be thieves. So we have to, you know, innovate um, with these are kind of terms in criminology. If you're a criminologist, we have to innovate and, and come up with our own ways to do this. Um, so you saw a whole spectrum of people ranging from those who said, I just want to kind of pretend that I'm a thief or pretend that I'm, you know, a murderer killing other players to people saying like, no, this is, you know, um, 
and, and forming groups around it. Uh, and, and so I, I think in a single player setting, you would have less reinforcement of that and that social dimension would be absent. Um, so you would be much more constrained by kind of the game mechanics, but you know, you do have people and, and I think going back to what I talked about in terms of cheating, I think, um, we shouldn't dismiss all cheating as sort of something we don't want because there's actually a lot of people who modify, um, games and it's, it's a whole, there's a whole scene around this. There's a whole kind of subculture around, um, modding, um, and like, uh, for example, um, glitching games and doing speed runs using glitches that the developers didn't intended. And it's mostly harmless. So, um, there, you know, there are forms of cheating that, affect other players and then those that don't. So it's the same with kind of this criminal role playing. Um, it, it, it's, there's a huge spectrum, but yeah, I, I'm not so sure about offline, but online, there's definitely a range there. Oh, thank you. I want to pop down a bit, a uh, question from Thabruni of if it is possible in the future to build a career out of the overlap between criminology and virtual reality. Well, uh, build a career, I, I mean, I think, um, I'm not sure, you know, certainly in, in terms of research, I hope there is, I've, I've uh, uh, begun work on some uh, projects um, looking at how, for example, virtual reality could be used um, in prison to, for example, um, have prisoners do home visits where they could, um, you could have a 360 degree camera in uh, the home of the family and they could, they could go there. You've seen things like uh, Microsoft, the HoloLens, where you can have augmented reality, you can have coworkers or friends in the same room as you virtually represented. So I think in terms of um, thinking about um, sort of mitigating pains of imprisonment, um, I think there's some potential there. Obviously, I would rather just reform prison, but I think, um, like I always thought, um, you know, those movies like Minority Report, um, where people are kind of put in this, or The Matrix is another representation, I guess, in a way, but where people are put in this like virtual world when they're incarcerated. Um, I think that's obviously portrayed in a very dystopian way. And they're certainly, you know, that's warranted in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, um, I think, you know, being put in solitary confinement is terrible. <laughs> and so I think if we have alternatives to that, that use technology like that, it could be, uh, you know, we could think about that in terms of humane alternatives. Um, other careers, I think, you know, I, I think the sky is the limit, really. I think as people spend more and more time in virtual worlds, I think you're going to need um, analogs to a lot of the same sort of actors you have in, in the real world. Um, which we can debate, you know, the necessity of those, but I think you will see some of that um, come into a, to a virtual space as well. All right, a question from Ashley. Are there studies that have looked at men, women, and other genders playing the same games and monitoring their activity over time? I'm curious as to whether the ways we are raised might influence how we internalize the gaming process and influence how we act after. Yeah, I think I've seen a couple of studies. Again, the over time question, I mean, there's a lack of longitudinal research just in almost every field. Um, and I think I haven't seen much longitudinal research on this. I have seen um, there, there's, and I won't put you on the spot, I, but I, I'm almost certain you've read some of this, Andrea, on MMOs and the, because there's different classes that you can play in MMOs if anyone plays these. And I know I've seen some research that looks at um, gender um, and other sort of uh, variables in connection to classes. And I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain. I think it kind of, the, the results, I, I, I don't want to make any claims, but I know there is research, but I just can't remember if 
um, they, you know, I'm in my head, I'm imagining that they found what you would, you know, would be kind of like s- the stereotype you would imagine that men were playing as like the beefy warriors and, and things like that. You would have to look, I would have to look, or you would have to look to verify it, but I have seen a little bit of research. Typically it's around the games that, um, where there's these sort of class distinctions. But I think that that's an interesting line of research because it can tell us something more nuanced than just games in a broad sense. Like, I think that's one thing that I've tried to emphasize is that the mechanics of a game matter. It's not just like the media kind of picks up on this idea of like, oh, look how realistic the violence is. But I think the mechanics also matter. So how are you interacting with that violence or how are you controlling you know the games that's why i say looking at simulation games i think is very different from looking at um you know like a first person shooter in terms of how the player interacts with the game oh i'm not sure we have time for another question because i have one but it's a big i'll one. do i'll do one more question okay i mean um, it's yeah, I just, I am curious as to what it means to take something like the carceral state, the prison, and present it in an environment where we expect something fun will happen, which is mm-hmm. essentially what it means to be like, here, here is a game, right? We expect to be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And, yeah. and so I would love to hear a very short amount more okay, <laughs> gosh. of what you think about what happens when we make prisons fun in that yeah context. yeah brevity is not my strong suit but i'll try um yeah i've actually co-authored a couple of pieces where we to some extent address that and um there's a game called um prison architect um and what we did when we researched that was we played the game obviously um and it is in fact a fun game if you're into sort of management simulation games it's gotten it's been cr- pretty critically acclaimed Um, But the developers actually looked, you know, they did, they did a podcast where they regularly talked about the development of the game. And they talked about these issues of, um, you know, it being a serious subject that involves social justice, you know, human rights and and some really serious stuff. Um, and you see this with other games like Papers, Please, and there's all these kind of, quote, serious games that are still entertaining. This war um, of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's, I think my interest there, and I'll wrap it up with this, is that play, as I mentioned, I mean, the research on play is really interesting here in terms of sort of it forming at a very early age, a lot of core kind of uh, foundations of how we interact and how we view the world. So I don't think that, you know, kind of embedding these serious topics within um, a context of play is a bad thing. Um, I think that, um, developers can do it in a way that doesn't trivialize the people who are suffering in those settings. Um, But I think it really requires developers to do research, to consult, like I would love developers to call me up, for example, if there's any out there. Um, So I think consulting with, you know, people who are activists and researchers and, and people affected by those things would actually make for a really nice intersection of play and um, kind of serious, uh, uh, you know, inspection of these these uh, institutions and dynamics in our in our lives. That is a really great way to end. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, thank you as well to all of you for joining us this evening for our last installment for this semester. Um, We'll be back in the fall with even more fascinating, cool stuff. And yeah, so thank you again. And thank you, Stephen, for this really fascinating discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.